what separates me from you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I represent the uh, gerontology section of the Beta Chi chapter. <laughs> <laughs> having, having been here when uh, John uh, Hampton was still alive, uh, <laughs> a pleasure to get a chance to speak. I, I will tell you, though, that uh, after after hearing from our, our colleagues of, of more recent years, that uh, I really did have a pretty dull and boring career compared to what these guys are doing, even though I enjoyed it immensely. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, uh, I had been asked by folks about, you know, what was your experience at, at Hampton Sydney? I said, well, I've done a lot of, of dumb things in my career in school, but one of the things that, that wasn't dumb was coming to Hampton Sydney. I, I think that my time here has served me well, and uh, I'll give you a couple of ideas about why I think that was the case. When I, when I came, we were at a time when a large chunk of the incoming class was pre-med, pre-vet, pre-dental, pre-healthcare, if you will. That was a, that was a huge area. And over time, folks come to find either I'm not very suited for this because I'm not doing so well in school, or I don't really like the curriculum, or somebody doesn't like me. And, and along the way, you, you kind of find your way to say, okay, is this, is this likely to work or not? Lots of folks apply, not so many folks uh, were getting in at, at that particular time. It's a, it's a little bit better now because we have a lot more school availability, but uh, I will just say thank you to MCV, VCU for taking me because my concern was if I didn't go to medical school, I'd have to go to chemistry grad school, and that's where the really smart people were. I knew I didn't belong there, so that, that was kind of a, an easy one. <clears throat> medical school, once you, once you get in, is actually not at all bad because the goal of the folks in medical school is to keep you in. They want you to graduate. They want you to do well. So the real fly in the ointment is just getting into the school. But once you're there, that, that part becomes easier. I had the, the pleasure of following what was my childhood uh, dream of uh, becoming a family doc. And I went out to Roanoke, did a family medicine residency, liked the area, uh, joined another guy. Uh, we did something that now is kind of unheard of, and that is we actually set up our, our own office in family medicine. And if you talk to anybody coming out of, of training in almost any area of, of healthcare now, almost no one sets up their own business. They wind up joining some larger group or somebody else who is established. The idea of actually setting up your own office is uh, uh, pretty uh, awesome. And it, for us, worked out well. And for about a third of my career, we enjoyed that. We ran the office, saw sort of your standard uh, patients. You know, you get sick, you have a tonsil infection, you're having various types of pains, like you go see your doctor. We did basic family medical care. Uh, as part of that, I enjoy doing a lot of long-term care, and that's to go see folks that are in nursing facilities and, uh, and getting rehabilitation. And I have to add, one of the fun things that we did early on was to actually make a house call. And I dare say there are very few in the room. Uh, well, I'll, I'll look around to maybe Dr. Like Dr. Porterfield. And there are a few folks that remember when doctors actually went to the home and saw folks, and that's very, very uncommon anymore. Uh, matter of fact, there are some concierge docs that will do that. Uh, but I have to tell you, if you ever really want to know what's going on inside somebody's family, inside the, the whole dynamics of what's going on in their life, going into their home is one of the most insightful things that you will, will ever get to enjoy. It actually is a, is a pleasurable thing. But that was a, a fun part of, of my career. Uh, probably the best home visit I think we ever did was when we were on a mission trip down to the Dominican Republic and going into one of those homes, which using the word home for any of us that live in the States, it's hard to describe what you see there. Um, Larry, I, I miss where you are, but you, you've been down in, in that neck of the woods and know just, just what I'm describing. But at some point, I uh, decided, you know what, uh, I think that uh, nearing retirement time, I think I want to do something a little bit different. And so. Uh, a couple years back, I decided it was time to, to bow out of the office, but I still enjoyed my relationship with older folks, particularly as I was becoming one, or had, had become one. And uh, over the age of 65, you're allowed to talk any, any Medicare issues with anybody because you're, you're one amongst them. So I have, uh, at this point, become a, a long-term care and a rehab doc and go into the nursing facilities and see folks there. And, and I would just tell you that it's, uh, it is an extremely rewarding thing because most 
uh, young folks coming out don't want to do that. Um, if, you, if you look across the room today, I, I'm going to guess that for most of you, if you're under the age of 50, your idea of going to the doctor is probably how quick can I get an appointment, how quick can I get in, and can I get what I need based on my previous look at Dr. Google at what I think I need. That, that, that's kind of the way healthcare is these days. If you look at people over the age of 50, you start to see so much more of chronic illness of folks that have things from Parkinson's disease to rheumatoid arthritis to cancer, and folks are, are looking for something different from their doc. And, and I think that is, in hindsight, kind of looking back at Hampton Sydney, that, that's a way in which Hampton Sydney has, I think, prepared me and why I enjoyed, have enjoyed doing that. Most folks, I think, assume if you go to see the doctor, you're at least going to have a basic level of competence. Those folks, you go in the door and you, you certainly hope that you are going to see a competent person, you're going to get competent care, you get somebody who's going to think through your problem. Almost everybody would like to see somebody who is going to listen well to them. You want to make sure that you know you are being heard, that I am explaining this and they're understanding it. And we now have in healthcare, as most of you know, I'm sure if you've been in the doctor's office any time recently, there is another person in the room, and that person is the computer that people are entering information on. And sometimes there may be a scribe in the room writing things down. That, unfortunately, I think has taken a lot away from the relationship between the patient and the provider. There's somebody else in there to sort of distract. And, and what I find is that particularly as folks get older and as they get more complex health issues, they want to make sure that they're being heard and that doctor is paying, paying attention to them. Folks, I am convinced, do want your empathy, your understanding. You have some sympathy to their condition you have an empathetic personality and, and uh, feeling towards them, and, and hopefully a dose of compassion. I mean, hopefully that you will have some ability to relate and say, hey, I am, I am sorry that this thing has happened, but we're going to help you work through it. And absolutely, I think the thing that we don't really hang on to anymore is that uh, folks are very much wanting somebody who's going to stick with them. And that's to say, if you come in my office and we diagnose you with X, Y, or Z, they're going to want to know that, that you, the doctor, are going to help them through that illness. I might not be the oncologist or I might not be the surgeon that is actually going to do the next level of work, but folks want to know that they can get back and touch with you, they can ask questions, they can have somebody who's going to help them along the road. Suppose I do have something that's terminal, suppose I'm going to die, is there somebody out there that's going to help me do this with some level of dignity and with some level of comfort? And I have found more and more that that is something that uh, we, we really have to attune ourselves to. We have to train ourselves to be good about that. And, we, and, and not only do we have to assure that we're going to do it, we have to help reassure the patient that we are interested in doing that. Well, coming back around, how, how does Hampton Sydney, how did Hampton Sydney prepare me or how did it prepare lots of folks for this? When we very first came here, those of us in the, <laughs> the geriatric section, we, we had a, an entry level course of Western man. Nowadays we have rhetoric, it, it has evolved along the way, but I think what the college has done all the way through has been to say, we know that you need skills in lots of different disciplines. We know that you need a background of knowledge about how people have evolved how thought has evolved, how religions have come around. I mean, there, there are so many elements that have come into this. When you look at what we're exposed to here, I think it helps us to have a much, much broader and better understanding of where people are coming from. And when I sit down with somebody and have a conversation and I'm trying to figure out, you know, why are they not taking their medication or why are they uh, acting in this particular way? Why are they being hostile towards the specialist I sent them to, you have to try your best to understand where they're coming from. And I think that in Hampton Sydney prepared me for that level of, of understanding and, uh, and really a means of better communication. Uh, all the guys that have been up here today, I mean, they don't use any notes, they stand here, they talk to you, and they communicate. You look at, at what happens over your four years here, and I think we all develop 
a hugely improved level of communication, and those communication skills are what, what drives the relationship that I have enjoyed through the years. And I, I would say that <coughs> given those types of basic um, skill sets, in addition to what we've learned in the sciences, and that's just sort of a slam dunk here. I don't think anybody uh, would even, it's hardly worth mentioning how great your education in the sciences is here, but if you look at the fact that most of us have really had a, a world-class level of scientific training by some of the best people in the world with the wonderful relationships that we've developed with one another and with our mentors, which keep you going. And that kind of takes me to the, to the very last piece of it, just to, to share with you. Um, again, I spoke to somebody earlier. There was a survey out just a week or so ago saying that post-COVID, there is probably a, uh, a predicted 20% decline in physicians coming up if they carry out what they're saying they're gonna do. Doctors are burned out. Doctors are really, really tired. They have, have just had too much. They're ready to wrap it up. And I think that you go back and you say, how, how do we prevent that burnout? And again, I come back to what we did here and think, you know, we spend a lot of time in this very building. I mean, a lot of time in this very building. We spend a lot of time doing other things on campus, though. Um, Fletcher's in the back. Fletcher was one of the folks that got the radio station started. There's the fire department. There's sporting events. There's all other kinds of other things that we do. The other things that you do, the extracurriculars here, but in life, are what help you to stay well-rounded and grounded and help you to keep from burning out. And I look at my doctor colleagues who are having this burnout type of issue, and I say, if you can maintain relationships maintain mentor relationships specifically, maintain extracurriculars that you enjoy. I think those are the things that, that keep us all going. So bottom line, I made a lot of dumb mistakes, but coming here wasn't one of them. <laughs>